I think people get too high when they get cheered. I think the reason people struggle when people shit on them in comments is because they're taking other people's opinions way too serious. You could literally make the greatest thing of all time. It's kind of like the tree in the forest. Like, you're gonna spend nine months making something that nobody sees? Seems like a waste of time. I believe in work ethic like nobody's business. I believe that work ethic is an enormous variable of success. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life, like nine to the nine. For my top 10, top 10, top 10, nine to the nine. This one's for my top 10. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Gary Vaynerchuk, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Listen. My deep capacity to be empathetic and grateful, which transforms in what most people see is somebody who markets. But in the way I navigate my life and the way that I market to the end consumer, my unbelievable opportunity to speak in front of this crowd today is predicated on listening. I talk, you listen to my podcast, I interrupt every single person that is on my show because I've already heard what they said and I just want to move it along and we don't edit. It seems mean, it seems audacious, it's deeply based on listening. We have to start the process of listening to the youth. They're telling us the answers. You just care what your neighbor thinks about your kid. You just care about what your mother thinks about your kid. You just care about what your sister thinks about your kid. You need to start listening to your kid. Rule number two, embrace judgment. On social, I watch so many kids that I'm looking at, watching them progress, have a terrible game, throw four picks, delete their shit. Delete it. G- hit me up on DM, I'm gonna, Gary Vee, I'm gonna detox off Insta. I know we've been talking, but like, off this, this game last week, I'm done. I'm coming back in October, and I always think about that shit. And we all have to figure out our relationship with technology. But here's how I take it from my purview. I think people get too high when they get cheered. I think the reason people struggle when people shit on them in comments is because they're taking other people's opinions way too serious. The best way to be able to help take care of and deal with people shitting on you is not getting too high when they're giving you accolades. When I watch videos like that, when people give, right now I'm on that place where I get so much love, I, I don't hear them. I really don't. I understand, I appreciate it, feels humbling as you know, but I don't hear them. I still think I suck, I'm grinding, I'm in the process, it's early. Which is why when people shit on me, and they do, a lot, because when you're out there like that, that's just how it is, I can't hear them either. And so one thing, one thing I would consider is actually using social media's negativity and judgment as an ability to actually absorb it, create a framework where you can actually accept both pros and cons at scale, instead of running away from it. Every time I see somebody shutting down and deleting, I get nervous because I don't see it as a detox for 99% of the people I talk to. I see it running away from judgment. And judgment is the only thing I promise you that you'll have for the rest of your life and that you have had. Rule number three, love what you do. I believe in work ethic like nobody's business. I believe that work ethic is an enormous variable of success. You just, I, and controllable, which is powerful. However, my, you know, through the years, what I've not done as good of a job, though I've sprinkled it, though I've done unique pieces of content about it, though my second book was called The Thank You Economy, though in my first book, Crush It, I speak about this. The reason this is a very easy answer for me is the way you sustain it is loving it. It doesn't become being a workaholic when you're doing your hobby. The reason I started telling people that any, the reason I, you know, when people hear anybody can do it, they're like, ah, Gary, this is the secret you, it's, I'm like, no, no, take a step back. We now live in an internet world where the cost of entry is zero. 
And every one of us who's listening right now has a passion, whether that's fishing, fashion, hair coloring, drinking wine, sport. I believe that anybody can start the process of creating content around something they're passionate about, which will always do better than something you're not passionate about. And that over time, that may lead to something that can pay you 30, 40, 80,000 euros or dollars a year, or eventually millions if you're ultimately talented. Rule number four, lean into your passion. If you're sitting here right now and you're real, real passionate about something that doesn't have to do with the four walls we're in right now, you need to lean into that because that's the thing the internet's doing. The amount of people that can make a real living around having a podcast or a vlog or flipping shit they love versus getting a job they hate and they can make as much or around the same much around having a podcast around Fortnite versus going and working in finance because they interned this summer in Wall Street and they think that's where the money is. That shit, I know nobody here believes but I've been saying it for a decade and I'm watching it every day and it's real. Also, if you wanna have more self-confidence and self-belief, I've designed a special free training to help you get it where every day for the next 254 days, I will send you a link to an unlisted video to your email to every day shift your confidence and self-belief forward. The science says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action to make a habit stick. And I want you to get the habit of self-confidence and self-belief The link to join absolutely for free is in the description below. The reason people aren't patient is they value other people's opinions too much. I think everybody here, if I told them, everything is gonna be okay. You can have everything you want. Now, what are you gonna do with your day? I think a lot of people know. I always choose positivity. Uh, I look at other people around me, it's not just about me, that are winning, they choose positivity. I look at the people around me that are not winning, that are not progressing, that are not advancing, they're choosing negativity. Rule number five, deploy patience. When me and my dad started having too much friction because I was getting the credit and became the man, and oh. he was, so, so when like, did that happen? That happened probably seven, eight years into me running the business, Okay. where it was like Gary, not Sasha. Right. And then that, because my, my dad's an alpha and he has pride, he came to this country with nothing, right. $100 in his pocket and built something. But then I took it to such an extreme level that it was friction and I was like, fuck this man, I'm not gonna not have a relationship with my dad. Mm-hmm. My brother was graduating college. I was like, fuck it, let's start something new. So the truth is, it wasn't that I woke up and I was like, wine's whack or I, I wanna do something else. It was that like, m- I just wanted to like have a real relationship with my dad and I was starting to like get really worried. And so did that start like an addictive process in which you just kept having to like move on to bigger and bigger things? I don't know if it's that. I think uh, from my standpoint, you know, the answer I gave to you, I eat my own dog food. Like straight up, like I deploy patience. Like I didn't think twice that at 34, I didn't have a whole lot of money. I built my dad's business for him. I was leaving with nothing. Really? Nothing? Nothing. I, didn't, I don't own anything from Wine Library. It's, I love when people leave comments like, oh, f- this guy, his, you know, his dad gave him a $4 million store. I'm like, no, no, no. I built my dad's business for him mm-hmm. to a totally different level. He gave me life and gave me the opportunity to build his store for him. But at 34 years old, I'm worth d- zero. So what do you do from there? I f- get some guy to pay us $80,000 to be a VaynerMedia client. I get Mike Boyd to f- work for free and sleep on the floor. We f- grinded. And seven years later, we have a $150 million business. And uh, I just worked. Rule number six, chase attention. I grew up in an environment where my dad worked every minute to try to make it in the new world and he eventually owned a liquor store in New Jersey. I was dragged into that when I was 14. And really from day one, um, I started doing two things that are interesting to me. I started doing a lot of UI, UX, which in, in the way I would say that was I started moving my dad's store around. I used to stand behind the register and it wasn't that busy, right? Like, you know, you know it, where I could watch almost every customer walk in and where would they go and what would they buy and intuitive as 14, I would understand like why do we send them that way where we sell stuff that's not as expensive as over here. Like really in hind, you know, a lot of this stuff in the last five years I've recalled. Even Lemonade, when I was six years old, Instead of standing behind my own lemonade stands, I got my friends to do it because I would literally walk up and down the streets of New Jersey watching cars drive by to try to figure out what tree or what post to put a sign on. So I've been truly intuitively chasing attention 
my whole life. As a matter of fact, that's gonna bubble up in a minute. One of the biggest reasons I push against television advertising and think it's grossly overpriced and overrated is not because I don't believe in the craft or a 30 second video, it's that I don't believe people are consuming them. You know, like that, that, I think that needs to matter. You could literally make the greatest thing of all time. It's kind of like the tree in the forest. Like, you're gonna spend nine months making something that nobody sees? Seems like a waste of time. Rule number seven, have accountability. To me, it's something that I'm pushing more clarity around, which is, I want you to be happy. And I, accountable. Of course, well, the beauty of entrepreneurship is without, there is, it's inherently accountability. Otherwise it fails. I do want people to be happy and I actually think accountability leads to happiness. When you think the government's in charge, the, the media's in charge, Facebook's in charge, this boss is in charge, when you believe somebody else is in charge of your life, you immediately start the process of unhappiness. Accountability is the framework of happiness. It doesn't mean bad things aren't happening. It's not delusion to the macro injustices of the world. It's called accountability. Rule number eight, love the game. My failures are funny because I'm an immigrant so I've always got, ne- I never do shit that's like gonna put me totally out of business. I always got a nest egg. I'm always on like third and a half bait. Like I'm never doing something that's like over the edge and if this fucks up it's like you know. My biggest mistakes have been the things I haven't done. I referenced it real quick. If you go read my first book in 2008, Crush It, 2008. I thank my family and one random person, Travis Kalkinick, who went on to start Uber, who used to, when me and AJ started VaynerMedia, used to fly around like in Vegas and and just hang out with us because he had no job, he was in between. Starts Uber, I'm investing like crazy on everything. He asked me to invest in Uber twice and I said no. Because I just bought an apartment, I was a little less liquid, I thought it was a side project for him. I also thought Uber was like a rich man's game. Like it was originally like, a limo on your phone. So I was like, you know, how big is that gonna be? And I passed twice. We got in a little bit later, you know, so we did all right. But, but I mean, I le- I mean, if I wrote my normal $50,000, $25,000 check, I probably left in the ballpark of 300 to 800 million on the table. So that's an L. <laughs> and on some real sh- like, I don't even feel it because what I've started to really learn about myself in the last year or so, is I'm about the process, not the trophies. I'm just about the process. I love my game. I love my game so much. I want to win. I'd like to have that W. But uh, money's funny, right? Like anybody who doesn't have it thinks it's the key to happiness and they're super confused and then they say, well, easy for you to say you, you have it. And I was like, yo, I didn't have it for a long ass time. I lived in the villas in Springfield Avenue in Springfield in a apartment until I was 28, buying nothing, making 40, 50,000 a year, working 90 hours a week in a liquor store, so I've tasted both. So I made a lot of mistakes. I pass on all sorts of shit. I just don't know what the mistakes are because I say no so much because I'm so busy. What if that one meeting was with, you know? Make a lot of mistakes. Rule number nine, figure out your strengths. I'm trying to get so much done in the 18 hours, 19 hours that I'm awake that to me every second matters and if I can hack it, like I'm gonna do it. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of not spending time on the shit that doesn't matter or the stuff I'm not good at. Mm-hmm. But I'll spend three hours reading every comment because I'm good at looking at it and synthesizing it and then understanding what the fuck is going on. Right. And so I think people think there's some smart way to do it. The smart way to do it, everybody, is to figure out what the you're good at, quadruple down on that and punt everything else. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is care about the customers. My ambition 10 years ago stays true today. I want to buy some of the most nostalgic brands that have ever existed when the next economy collapses. So when this economy finally collapses, I want to go buy Kit Kats, Bubblicious, K-Swiss, you know, Ralph Lauren, I wanna buy brands and then I wanna be the CEO of it. And what I knew then was I understood small businesses, I understood Silicon Valley, I didn't understand Fortune 500 businesses. But I wasn't gonna go get a job, so I decided to start the agency because at that point I realized marketing was my superpower. Hanging out with all those Silicon Valley titans, 
why was I invited to the dinner? Why were they listening to me? It's because they were great at tech, but I really understood. One of the biggest reasons, forget about the current way people view Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg's deep understanding of human psyche was the number one reason we connected. I think I'm an extremely good marketer because I think this entire thing that we're at right now is an internal B2B ecosystem and the only thing I pay attention to is the end consumer. I know so little about what's going on here. This is, this is literally the first three years I was here, I only did this event. I didn't know anything else. You guys remember, I don't, I st- Harriet just joined us to run comms from BBDO, she's incredible. I'm still asking her on the way here. She's like, we were fi- final list, what's it called? Shortlist. She's like, we were shortlisted for a bunch of stuff today. I'm like, I don't even know. I, I literally thought it was finalist. Like, I still, don't. Adam, yesterday we won a silver thing, and I was like, what does that mean? Like, I still am so deeply unaware of what's happening here. Not out of audacity, not out of disrespect. I actually love coming here, the vibe. I love hanging with you guys. I love this. It's just that everything I think about is the consumer. It's the only thing that matters. And, and that's why I believe that. You know, and I, I'm, I'm humbled by some, you know, the most interesting or one of the, uh, one of the mo- we're doing some of the most interesting things because we just see it different. We just see it different and the way we see it is practical. So, I mean, the far majority of what you've already worked on, you would have never consumed. <laughs> that's the f- truth. And I think that's, that's my, aspiration to come to things like this. Actually have a conversation about what the hell's going on, right? Like, creativity is amazingly fun. I think that we have to be very thoughtful that somebody's paying us to make something happen. You know, I think there's a a lot of audacity that seeps into this craft where it becomes about ideology and, and selfish behavior. I watch creatives and strategists make decisions all the time based on what they want to blow up a building. They want to meet John Legend. They want this joke to see the world. It has nothing to do with what the client needs and definitely nothing to do with does the end customer care. Now I've got a very special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you get motivated, inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through. But when you get motivated, inspired, and you create a plan of action, you have a over 90% chance of following through. And when you share it with other people, it jumps to 95% chance your likelihood of following through. And so I want that to be you from this video. We don't just watch videos here, Believe Nation. We do something, we take action. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below because I wanna celebrate you. Most, most people continue to parent their children based on what they think other people think of them, not by listening to their actual children. This is a very important conversation. We cannot get to the path of all the other talks that we've been listening to without eliminating entitlement. It is very difficult to be empathetic or grateful without eliminating entitlement. We must put accountability on a pedestal. We must destroy eighth place trophies. That doesn't mean that we don't admire effort, but results matter in life. My mother gave me so much self-esteem that it makes some people not like me. However, she equaled that with uncomfortable amounts of accountability. When I went 0 for 4 in a baseball game and struck out four times, it wasn't the son's fault. It wasn't my coach's fault. She looked me in the face and said, you sucked. Evan, thank you so much for having a couple seconds and being able to tell the Believe Nation a little bit about Empathy Wines, it means a lot to me that you would take this valuable real estate and and time on your channel to give me some love, means a lot. It's just good karma points and so you're just, you're awesome, thank you. Believe Nation, uh, if you're into wine at all, go to empathywines.com. My whole career's work was poured into producing a wine that rivaled 40 to $60 wine for 20 bucks a bottle. Uh, I'm just super excited about this subscription-based wine business. You can order three, six, or 12 bottles in subscription form, rosé, white, red. Um, if, you, if you search on Instagram or, or Twitter, you will be blown away. People are literally like, I don't even like Gary Vee, but the wine's good. 
super proud of the effort. Thanks Evan for the time. Uh, wishing you guys all happy and healthy. If you want to learn how to market on social media like Gary Vee, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there.